Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 134. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm so glad that you could join me. As this is the first episode of the month, I'd like to begin by thanking the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast and welcome patrons who joined the Talking Tudors family in October. A very warm welcome to Kat, P.A. Herman, M, Lacey, Jazz, Lisa and Gillian. I'm so very grateful for your immense generosity and support. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. November's prize is a fabulous Tudor-themed book pack consisting of the Mary Queen of Scots Book of Days and the Queen Elizabeth I Book of Days. Informative and beautifully produced, these books pair a practical perpetual diary with factual information. A huge thank you to the Tudor Times for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. At the end of the month, I'll be chatting to Adrian Dillard about Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, notebooks and apparel. New items will also be added over time. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I'd love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited to welcome back Tony Riches to the show to chat about Robert Devereux. Tony is a full-time UK author of best-selling Tudor historical fiction. He lives in Pembrokeshire, West Wales, and is a specialist in the lives of the Tudors. Best known for his Tudor trilogy, Tony's other published historical fiction novels include The Brandon Trilogy, about the life of Charles Brandon and his wives, and an Elizabethan series. For more information about Tony's books, please visit his website, tonyriches.com. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Talking Tutors, Tony. How are you? I'm great, and I really appreciate you inviting me back again, particularly to talk about the Elizabethan Tudors. Yes. Because I've been immersed in them for the last two years. Fantastic. Well, and, before uh, we before we dive into uh, that, do you want to just introduce yourself to everyone and just yes. tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give the short version. <laughs> I'm a full-time author based in Pembrokeshire, and I was actually born very close to Pembroke Castle, which fairly obviously got me interested in the, the, the real story about um, Henry VII. And I gathered together enough information for, for three books. So I decided to do a trilogy, which became known as the Tudor Trilogy, where he's born in the first book, comes of age in the second with Jasper Tudor, and then becomes king in the third. And um, I then started to think about what comes next. And I thought it'd be fascinating to talk about his son, Henry VIII, from the perspective of three different, very different points of view. His youngest sister, Mary, and then his best friend, Charles Brandon, and then Charles Brandon's last wife, who some say could have become Henry VIII's seventh wife. But if you know that her mother was Maria de Salinas, uh, then you think that's pretty unlikely because she would have been brainwashed from birth that he was an evil tyrant, perhaps. But anyway, um, that became the Brandon trilogy. And I realised then that if I could take the storyline from Owen Tudor's first meeting with Catherine of Valois right up to the death of Elizabeth I, then I would have a seamless timeline of the Tudors. So that's where the Elizabethan series came in. And Elizabeth is so complicated as a person. I thought it'd be quite fun to show her through the eyes of three of her favourites, each of whom had very, very different perspectives on the Queen. And I chose Drake, who had a massive chip on his shoulder, and then, of course, Robert Devereux, who we're talking about today, who was a typical example of the privileged, um, penniless elite. And then the one that I'm about a third of the way through now is about a chap called Walter Raleigh. And fascinatingly, everything I was taught about Walter Raleigh proves to be either absolutely wrong or perhaps a bit um, debatable, <laughs> including his cloak, which was the story of the cloak was written 20 years after his death or something. So um, anyway, so rather than finish it there, I, I just became fascinated by Elizabeth's ladies, her ladies in waiting. So I'm going to, when I finish this book, I'm going to do another final Tudor trilogy, which looks at Elizabeth through the eyes of three of her ladies-in-waiting. And that's what I'm actually researching now. And that is just so much fun. I think um, I might even do six of her ladies-in-waiting. <laughs> but uh, no, there's just so much information about the Elizabethans. I can, I can actually find the original letters and the whole of the court records day by day. So I'm spoiled really now. Wow, that is good news. I didn't know about the the new series that you were working on. So that's that's really good to hear that. And and as you said, today we're going to focus on one of the characters or protagonists of your one of your Elizabethan books, or Elizabethan series books, which is Robert Devereux, as you mentioned, Earl of Essex. So when did you first become interested in in his life and his story? I'd been vaguely aware of him. I hadn't actually chosen him as my second um, major character, but I was I was actually researching Drake. And Drake was about to launch his English Armada. Some people didn't even know there was an English Armada. And uh, he's a, quite a serious guy, Drake, and um, very proper and correct when it comes to the Queen. And um, he, he finds out that this Noble. He doesn't like nobles, by the way, because he's got a chip on both shoulders, and he particularly doesn't like young, entitled queen favourite nobles. And so he's absolutely appalled when he hears that uh, the Earl of Essex has galloped down to Falmouth, jumped on the Swift Shore, which is one of his ships, and has already sailed to join him. And just to make it even worse, uh, he gets the message that it's against the Queen's wishes. And uh, they're all in big trouble when they get back home, <laughs> including Drake, who's, of course, quite innocent of all of this, but is culpable by association. And I thought, oh, this is just a, a bizarre story. Why would Essex do that? And of course, I, I started looking into his story much more. And the most amazing thing happened was that I found out that he lived at Lampy Palace. Now, Lampy Palace is 20 minutes from where I'm talking to you now and um, I often used to go there because it's free and it's just down the road 
and you can wander it on a lovely summer afternoon. And uh, it was, of course, where Margaret Beaufort lived while she was expecting Henry VII. So yeah, I always thought it was Margaret Beaufort's place. And to find out that Robert Devereux found, spent his sort of teenage formative years there was amazing. But his sister, Dorothy, this is, was uh, the lady of Carew Castle, which is also about the same distance from my house. And I used to live in Carew. So I had all these connections all of a sudden. And the research, this is, was during the lockdown, was right on my doorstep. Literally, I could go there, get a sense of the place. And I'd already been to Ireland, to Dublin, and walked down to the waterfront. And so I had a real sense of the geography of all of that. And he seemed an ideal character for looking at the Queen from a very different perspective. Absolutely. You're so lucky to have all that wonderful history on your doorstep. No doubt about that. And so tell us a little bit. Sorry. I said, I feel privileged. Yes. What? And I'm glad that you realise it because sometimes when you've got it, you know, so close, you kind of, oh, yeah, I might get there one day. (laughs) That's really good. So, Tony, can you tell us a little bit more about Devereux's early, like his family, perhaps, and and his early years? It's interesting because uh, most people didn't have a clue about his mother, Lettuce. And then um, recently there's been a uh, Who Do You Think You Are on BBC, which has been going into great detail about her family. And so all of a sudden, everybody's um, <laughs> quite well informed about it. But he came from a, a, a what we would now call a very dysfunctional family because they lived at Chartley Manor and there was Robert with his two older sisters and... Um, also his younger brother Walter and they their father was absent most of the time because he'd been tricked by Elizabeth into uh, fighting in Ireland at his own expense uh, which which was typical of her she kept promising that she would send him money for his troops but he was just using all of his money he'd been made the Earl of Essex as as a sort of sweetener but it meant nothing if he had no money left and then Robert's mother, of course, was Lettice or Lettice, as the BBC call her. Interesting. But she was absent as well. So she was always off enjoying herself at parties and with a certain um, associate of hers uh, called Robert Dudley. And so while her husband was away in Ireland, so the, the children were left to, to almost go feral. They had a whole succession of tutors that they were having quite a good time at, at Charlie Manor. And then uh, all of a sudden there's this hammer blow, which is that the, a messenger comes through that his father has died in Ireland and all of their lives change in an instant because basically what happens is in his father's will uh, is a provision that Robert, as his oldest son, should be taken into the care of uh, uh, William Cecil and so you know straight away he's he's torn away from his family home and uh, into this very strange world of the Cecils yes and uh, you know in one step he's he's really in in a privileged environment he's obviously aware of of what his mother's up to because he's nine years old he's we have to remember nine years old at in those days was slightly different to, to, to when I was nine years old. I think nine years old now are quite worldly wise as well, aren't they? <laughs> yes, so, they um, so his childhood was quite troubled and um, his, his mother wasn't really a mother to him. And that's quite a key thing later on. And uh, he was really, his sister Penelope was um, his kind of the closest he had to a mother, but she wasn't that much older than him, but she had to grow up fast, as you can imagine. So that's the kind of context of it all. And then uh, William Cecil promptly sends him off to Cambridge, where he does it extremely well, because he's he's actually surprisingly gifted and talented academically. And he gets his master's degree in almost record time, you know, whereas um, other people drop out of university and don't ever really get the benefit of it. He very much did. So on top of everything else, um, he ends up, with really quite a a solid education from the best tutors in the country. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about when he first comes to Elizabeth's court. And now that you mentioned Cecil, I was just wondering, is that the link that gets him in there? Well, it it is interesting because as a boy, because of his mother, he would have have had opportunities to meet the Queen, but of course those aren't necessarily documented because there's it's documented with his mother was she was a lady in waiting until it all went horribly wrong and so 
he would have been aware. I, I put a little scene in my book where um, he meets the Queen as a boy and she uh, she leans forward to kiss him and he takes an involuntary step backwards because he's not he's not that keen on kissing the Queen. Whether that's whether that happened, but it, it, it could have happened because of the circles that they moved in. And uh, you can imagine that um, Elizabeth might have remembered that from, you know, as it didn't happen that often. People were quite pleased to kiss her. He properly met her after he'd finished at Lampley Palace and he'd, he'd finished at university and everything like that. And he actually went to court in uh, 1585 and was properly presented as the Earl of Essex. Uh, so he was penniless and she was arguably the richest woman in the world, certainly one of the most powerful women in the world. He had virtually no power whatsoever and was living almost like a serf at Lampy Palace. You know, they were, they were living a very rural agrarian sort of life there. And um, so she had everything that he wanted, power and the money. And he was right enough to think that it was within his grasp. And of course, he had the youth and the vigour and the he was he was quite a striking figure. He was, you know, head taller than most of his contemporaries and um, not frightened to speak his mind and definitely not. Whereas Drake would fall to his knees and stutter and be quite terrified of her. Essex treated her like like his mother, really, probably with even less respect than he might have treated his mother because she was quite a um, serious character, really. And the Queen would encourage that because of the effect on her other courtiers is that she would enjoy the looks on their faces when he's being flippant with her or not, not necessarily bowing and all that kind of thing. But she could turn on a sixpence and then um, um, castigate him for it, you know, and treat him like a boy, like which he was really. So that, that kind of sets the scene for their relationship in that they both had, in my view, what the other really longed for. Because this... This Queen Elizabeth isn't the Gloriana, the, the glamorous young queen. She's the aging queen who you could, if you do some, you could say that she could be his grandmother technically. And she's very much, um, but bearing in mind that his mother was often mistaken for the queen because she looks so much like her. If you look at the two of them side by side, and of course there's always this link through um, that they could actually be related. So when he looked at the queen, he would think of her more like a grandmother figure, but in a very calculated way. Yeah. And so the, when he arrives at court, I think so Elizabeth's in her, if I can do my maths correctly, in her 50s at around that, that time that he that he gets there. And what positions is he working in? Does he have an official position or is he just kind of loitering? Well, his what happens, as we know, is that um, his mother marries Robert Dudley, much to everybody's yeah, horror. Cool. Um, it's, I think that the person that made that happen was his grandfather on his mother's side, Sir Francis Knollys, who was a powerful figure at court and an old school Protestant and really wasn't happy with his his daughter um, living, cohabiting with, with Leslie. You know, that was just not, not going to happen. And so he probably held a gun to their head in somewhere <laughs> and uh, the consequences of it because of they all got banished from court eventually the dust kind of settled a bit but although lettuce was never never accepted back again we know that robert dudley was kind of always present wasn't he at the time lester was master of the horse and i think that um, it was within his gift and influence to pass that job on to Essex, you see, because interestingly, Charles Brandon was master of the horse as well. And on his garter stall in um, St. George's Chapel, it says Meister of the Horse, <laughs> which is like almost something out of um, Game of Thrones. Yes, but yes. Um, that's a powerful job because it means whenever the Queen goes out riding, um, Essex is there at her side. He's in charge of the stables and everything like that. But he's also able to have patronage and do favours and or promise favours and never do them, which was probably more his style. <laughs> and uh, it was paid as well, paid work for very little real effort. So he thought it was quite a, a good number, you know, master of the horse. Whereas Robert Dudley, of course, didn't really care one way or the other whether he was master of the horse or not, I don't think. 
Yeah, fascinating. And so you talked a little bit about the fact that obviously Essex is is young, handsome, witty, charismatic. So obviously Elizabeth's attracted to all of that. And she, as you said, likes to see how um how the others didn't like it and you know that competition that she enjoyed around her. But to tell us a little bit more about why and it's sort of how he becomes one of the Queen's favourites, I suppose. Yeah, the, he, he calculated how he could actually get access to whenever he wanted it. And um, there's lots of records of things like um, Anthony Baggett wrote to his father that they, they play cards till the small hours of the morning. And that was probably true because they both encouraged each other. They both brought out, uh, you could say, the worst qualities of each other in terms of appropriateness because, you know, there were strict protocols about when the Queen was allowed to be alone with any man at all, and whether they were alone or not. They certainly used to, he was around there all the time, and um, getting all sorts of favours, getting grants of land, slowly getting back all his father's properties that had been confiscated, including Chartley Manor. The Queen, not only did she get away with uh, having to repay his father all the money that his own money that he'd spent on the Irish campaign, she confiscated most of his properties in lieu of his debts. So that means that Robert Deborah really was a pauper in real terms, that he was described as the poorest earl in England. So it was hugely important to him to exploit this relationship. And as I've already said, Elizabeth loved it. She loved having somebody that was trying to get the better of her, especially a, a, a young chap. And she liked the court gossip about it. And she probably encouraged people to speculate as to whether there was anything going on. My own view is there absolutely was not anything going on because firstly, there's there's no real evidence of it at all. And secondly, Robert Deborah had his pick of ladies around and, uh, you know, did actually have a whole string of affairs and relationships going on and of course eventually he married um, of all people Sir Francis Walsingham's daughter who was also called Francis spelt with an e and um, sadly he just carried on as normal although he'd married this incredibly bright and um, astute uh, woman he he consistently underestimated her for the whole of their marriage so he had affairs behind her back blatantly fathered children and all sorts of things and um, she would have been the making of him and the saving of him because being Walsingham's daughter she was really tuned in to the whole of the European politics and and the network she was well educated and uh, I felt really sorry for her quite Mm. honestly because um, what a life you know. Yeah that is quite tragic do we know what um, her father thought about about how he he was treating her? Um, oh, he was already. He, he died, and he was another sad story. And we will have to come up to a, a happy story in a minute. Yes, we're but he a bit sad. And um, he was buried in haste at midnight, right? Uh, because if if they didn't do it quickly, he he was so much in debt that his debtors might have realised and swooped like uh, vultures. And so that was all a bit sad. What what a ignoble end for somebody that did so much for Absolutely. Elizabeth. You know, I, I'm tempted at some point in the future to write a book about uh, Walsingham's life as well, because what a character he was, you know? The the, the present day spin doctors got nothing on him because he, he had a proper European network of informers, both on the Catholic side and the Protestant side, the whole time. So nothing, it's like a spider in the middle of a web, isn't it? Nothing could happen anywhere without him knowing the truth, really. Yeah, we're spoilt for um, interesting characters in this period, aren't we? Yeah. And and what about, so Robert Devereux's father, as you said, was in Ireland. Was, tell us about Devereux's military career. We have to picture this. I started seeing him like a, 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 an oversized puppy because he, was, he had far too much enthusiasm, a, a tremendously inflated opinion of his own abilities and just if he was to just hesitate for a moment and think he had no military training or experience really and um, he was appointed as a commander of men it reminded me a bit of the first world war you know when when um, if somebody had been to university they became the, the captain or the major or whatever and they had much better 
experienced and qualified men under them and they used to send them over the top and his his experience was like that because he did he did get sent off uh, to the netherlands with with robert dudley so he had every opportunity to learn um, from somebody who knew how to command men and how to behave in battle and all that kind of thing but that was all a trick because at the time elizabeth had let it be known that she wanted to imprison um, mary queen of scots at chartley and uh, robert knew that if that happened he might he might lose chartley and never get it back again so he was making an issue of it so she just sent him abroad basically and as soon as he as soon as he'd set foot on the ship she put mary at chartley so she didn't promise not to by the way but that's what she actually did but he got nothing quite honestly and he used to charge into battle with the cavalry at the front as if he was a skilled cavalryman and of course he wasn't and it, through luck more than anything else he, he survived most of it and then later on i mean there's there's several campaigns but i'm i'm thinking of particularly when he was with Drake and um, they went to the, the siege of Lisbon and um, basically Drake put um, Essex as the rear guard. <laughs> the rear guard isn't a great job because basically everybody else, including Drake, scarpers quickly if things are not going in their favour and goes to a place of safety and the rear guard protect the, the, the stragglers sort of thing. And right from the start, there's an account of how Essex gets rowed ashore in, in his boat and dives into the water in his armour, you know, and his men follow him, but some of them can't swim and they drown and there's all this kind of thing before they've even set foot ashore. But as commander of the rear guard, he, he realises he's been stitched up a bit. And the story is that he, he goes to the gates of the city and plunges his lance into the gates and challenges anybody who wants to come out and have a fight, now's your chance. <laughs> I don't know who recorded all of the, the details of that, but it's it's a great story, which I think sums up his character. Fearless, but also recklessly foolhardy. It's just so intriguing. You know, I, I, I've, I've put in my blurb that he's one of the most intriguing men of the Elizabethan court, and that's quite a, quite a claim, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> Given the other characters there at the Elizabethan court. But who else would have done that? You know, can you imagine William Cecil doing that or... <laughs> Robert says none of them would. Even Raleigh um, raised an eyebrow at that, uh, you know, and um, Drake, of course, was not at all surprised. It was exactly what he would expect. And Tony, tell us about what happens, his behaviour and his actions during the campaign in Ireland and, and what happened when he returned to London. This is where it all starts going horribly wrong. There's, there's a couple of things I need to say. Firstly, that having been to Ireland and... Um, explored it quite thoroughly. I have a huge respect for the Irish and I'm appalled by the massacres at Rathlin Island and all those sort of things that happened um, with all of the three people that I'm writing about in this Elizabethan series. They were all culpable in different ways but Essex was sent away again. He was making nuisance to himself so he was sent away to be the sort of Lord Marshal of, of the English troops in, in Ireland and to Dublin and at first he was quite excited because he was able to redeem his father's work because he was able to finish the job that his father had started so there's a kind of circularity to it here by the way I've got a theory that his father was actually poisoned the, the, the history books say that he died of dysentery but there was a lot of poisoning going on it would have been so easy to poison him because his servants were Irish he didn't treat them very well at all that's documented and um, it would have been such an easy thing to put some, I don't know, digitalis in his soup or something like that, because he died in agony over three days, which sounds to me more like poisoning than dysentery. But anyway, but that's at the back of uh, Robert Devereux's mind. And he, he actually has the job of going from castle to castle in inland into Ireland through the worst kind of um, country for being ambushed by what they called the rebels. That's the local inhabitants are called the rebels so you know, if you're a rebel then then you're allowed to be just um, executed without trial or anything uh, but these are in fact the inhabitants of the country and then he would go to the castle ransack it and uh, claim it in the name of the queen and then the next day they'd, they'd um, back up and move on to the next castle sometimes the the, the lords would surrender to queen or the crown 
And so it was a more amicable arrangement, but generally it was quite a, a vicious business. And of course, very high risk for Robert Devereux because several times he nearly got killed to get separated from his men and all those sort of things. And then he has the opportunity to meet um, the Earl of Tyrone and without any authority and completely against Elizabeth's wishes. Elizabeth wants to colonize Ireland, carve it up and um, share out the land as favors to her loyal followers. And what Robert Devereux does is does a deal with with Hugh O'Neill and then decides to come home. <laughs> so yeah. that's that's two bad things because he knows he's not supposed to come home without permission. He's not supposed to do any deals without authority. Worst possible scenario. And you know when he comes home, uh, he's he's almost a social outcast because nobody's impressed by that. They don't care about the detail of it, of course, because and they had a very different perspective on it as well. And so, what year? What year was that, Tony? That he went to well, Ireland? Um, we we seem to have sort of skipped past the Spanish Armada, <laughs> and I, I was going to. I was going to mention, of course, that in uh, 1588, then um, not only was there the Spanish Armada and uh, Robert, interestingly, was at Elizabeth's side when she gave the speech yes. at Tilbury. And of course, then Robert Dudley dies. So that, that meant then that the way was clear for him to be really Elizabeth's main favourite um, because the, the, he had no real competition. Poor old Raleigh for a while was... Was yes. Elizabeth's favourite, but of course he was he, a different thing. Well, I won't. I won't go. Into, that's for another time. Perhaps next year. But he, he's got some great stories as well. Most of which people aren't aware of either. We're talking about three years before Elizabeth actually died, and he's put on trial. Robert Devereux put on trial. I'm not talking about the big trial in Westminster Hall. I'm talking about basically to have him to have all of his assets stripped from him and to basically any money that he's managed to accumulate, any land, you know, that Elizabeth wants it back for the crown, really. So it has been some trials, so rather curious things. Well, Tudor trials generally, aren't they? Yes. I can think, yes. can't think of any where I think, well, that was that was justice being that seen. That was a done. fair trial, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. <laughs> and he just gets very bored with it all. Um, he's inherited what is now called Essex House on the Strand, and he gathers around him various people that he's come across in his travels, like Henry Rothersley, who he was in Ireland with, and they bring out the worst in him. They encourage him to do all sorts of outrageous things and to tell the people trying to inquire into what really happened, where they could go with their inquiry and all of that sort of thing. And they just have a whole series of parties. He invites his sisters around. So he basically barricades himself into Essex House in the Strand. <laughs> well, that's not a very good idea, is it? Mm. Uh, what he should have been doing was going on his knees to the Queen and humbly begging her forgiveness in front of everybody. She would have liked that, I think. And perhaps even said, I tell you what, I'll go back to Ireland humbled, and at my own expense, I'll put right the wrongs, and I'll win Ireland back for you, and um, all of that. Two other people did, by the way, but he didn't do any of that. Instead, <laughs> he carried on partying. That's where it really started going wrong big time. Because if he'd not done that, if he'd gone to the Queen and, and basically prostrated himself, it would have been much harder for things to end up as, the, as they did. Yes, exactly. And you mentioned the word reckless before, and that, that comes up a lot, I think. So in 1601, instead of doing all the, the, the clever things you've just suggested, he in fact attempts to mount a rebellion. He thinks that's a good idea and try and overthrow the government. So what pushed him in the end to this just oh, well, crazy plan? We have to be clear that he wasn't trying to overthrow the queen. Right. He was yes. trying to save her from right. her corrupt <laughs> advisors. Yeah. That's what they and, always uh, say, Tony. That's what they that's always right. say. <laughs> <laughs> he liked the queen. He was like his grandmother. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. <laughs> but sadly, the very people that she sent to talk, to talk him, talk sense into him were the members of the Privy Council who, in his book, were the corrupt advisors. So he reacted badly to that and sent them packing. In fact, he imprisoned them in, in Essex House for a while, which was a really bad idea as well. It's one of the worst things you can do. And then, encouraged by those around him, he decides to march 
it's almost like a protest march these days we would imagine you know like imagine a load of students on a protest march it's not um an assault on the army it's not a coup it's it's marching down the strand he lives on the strand so it's outside his front door basically to the law of mayor of london who he believes will back him because he believes the lord mayor of london agrees with him that the advisors are all corrupt and evil and giving the queen bad advice when he gets there, he finds he's facing um, a small army of people. And what he should have done was laid down his sword and said, I'm sorry, this is just not what I expected. <laughs> but the story is that one of his followers fires a shot. It's a classic thing, isn't it? Somebody fires a shot and then it all goes to pieces. And um, he just about manages to escape back to Essex house. And then it's so easy to surround somewhere like that when you've got a whole army and so he had no choice it was too late to do anything then because the the so-called corrupt advisors at privy council could happily point out that what he'd done was committed an act of uh, treason and should suffer the treason you know the penalty for treason which is you know the worst kind of death but of course he's persuaded to um, surrender rather than fight to the death in Essex House, which he probably would have been tempted to do, actually, knowing him. But he surrenders and he goes to um, Westminster Hall, which, have you been to Westminster Hall? Have you been inside? Yes, oh, yes, I have. That's an experience, isn't it? That's amazing. Because stand in Westminster Hall, I didn't have it to myself, but it felt like I did because it's such a cavernous place. Yes. You can stand there and think, wow, this is where so many things have happened, mm -hmm. you know? From you know Winston Churchill's funeral to um, the trial of Robert Devereux, cleverly he decides the best person to defend him is himself. So <laughs> <laughs> instead of having a whole array of top lawyers who get them on technicalities, he decides to tell the honest truth, and um, everything will be fine. He believes that the Queen loves him, and she, you know she's punishing him by putting him on trial. Two people that he, he basically relied on throughout his life decided this was the perfect moment to make a name for themselves. That was really quite an awful thing. Robert Cecil, we have to remember that he grew up with Robert Cecil. I mean, if you wonder why I hesitate sometimes, I'm trying not to put spoilers in because there's some things I found out that are in the book that um, I would prefer readers, if they want to read the book, to, to discover as they go along. But basically, the whole thing about Robert Cecil is that um, he feels he was insulted and wronged by um, Robert Devereux's testimony and decides to really fall on his knees and bleed to the, the judges that completely different perspective on the whole story you know and then the other person this was a real shock for Robert Devereux was Francis Bacon I don't know how much you know about Francis Bacon but he was a Machiavellian character and his He's another one you could write a whole book about. And um, it was Francis Bacon that he employed to, to help him learn how to be a politician. And so they they worked together. They, they lived together for quite a long time. And he trusted him implicitly. And when the judges said, has anybody else got anything else to say before we deliberate? Francis Bacon stands up and does a complete and eloquent character assassination on Robert Devereux which is almost like the final straw, you know? And from that, there is no going back because he, he describes it as one of the clearest treasonable acts that there could be. And uh, if they let him, let him off with it, then where does that leave the country? So it's very sad, I think. You know, they, they can only come to one conclusion, really, after all of that. But to be... To be let down by somebody that you grew up with as a boy, you know what I mean? And yeah. also somebody that you you trusted and um, confided in for years. That must have been pretty awful, quite honestly. Yeah, what an incredible scene. I That was not, um, when I was at Westminster Hall, I was there more thinking about the trial of the men charged alongside Anne Boleyn, but I, I didn't think of that trial, but that's an interesting one to, to ponder while well, you're there as well. Oh, when we fascinating things about writing about the Elizabethan court. When I when I started writing about Owen Tudor, I had to be like a, a real detective digging out any mention that was valid, you know. 
with the Elizabethan cut, the whole file of Robert Dethrow is just available with a quick wow. Google and all the, you know, all different accounts, which, which actually tally with each other, contemporary things in court records. There's so much documentation and his letters, of course, I've got two volumes of his letters. Really, you, you develop a picture of it, which is so vivid that um, it's quite compelling, really. That's wonderful. So he's convicted of treason, presumably, and then is he sent to the Tower for a period? Yeah, I, I, I was really lucky because the month that the pandemic started in the UK, uh, in March last year, I was just able to squeeze in a visit to the Devereux Tower, Tower of London, which the general public aren't allowed. It's actually got a, a sign on it, it says the Devereux Tower. And I went into the chapel and I literally had, there was only me and a beef eater in there and my wife. And uh, he said, you know, take whatever photos you like, take as long as you like. So I was able to go and pay my respects to Robert. There's a plaque on the floor right next to Anne Boleyn is um, Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex. Isn't that, isn't that one of those strange things? That's you know, amazing, they end, up, they end up side by side. And um, so that's that was a quite a, it is, it is quite an emotional thing it because is. when you've invested um, a year of your life in researching about a particular individual, to actually be standing at their grave. I like to do that with most of them. I did it with Charles Brand and obviously with Henry the Seventh and, and Henry the Eighth. <laughs> that was an easy one. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, but no, seriously, um, I'd, I'd been in that chapel before, not even ever known about Robert Devereux being there or why he was there or anything like that. So that was really quite interesting. Yeah, it is an incredibly moving experience. I remember my um, my experience there as well, very clearly. So he's imprisoned and then he is executed. Tell us a little bit about his end, Tony. Well, the Queen was very good to him. I mean, um, you know, you could imagine she would be a bit miffed. But what she did um, in a, an act of real generosity, um, she, she allowed for him to be executed in private rather than public. Isn't that kind? That's that's a Very nice kind, suggestion. kind Elizabeth. Um, also, not to be hung, drawn, and quartered, that is uh, good. which was within her gift. Though actually, that was quite unusual for a noble to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Yeah. But there was a precedent, and um, he had been a bit naughty, so there was public demand for it. Mm. You know, they would have turned out in their thousands to see yeah. that. And instead of that, it was a, a solemn occasion. And interestingly, for me. One of the witnesses, who was the captain of the Queen's Guard, was one Walter Raleigh. And um, while I was at the tower, I obviously went up into Walter Raleigh's tower and stood at his window and looked out. And the, and um, it's just, it almost makes the, the hairs on your arm stand up to think that I put my hand on the window ledge and that that is exactly what he would have done. I wasn't able to do that in the Devereux Tower because there's a debate about whether exactly where he was imprisoned and which cell and all. But with with Raleigh, there's no question of it. It's you know he's got his his cell in his tower and all of that kind of thing. And I would recommend to anybody who ever goes to London, if you go to London and you've not been to the Tower of London, then go and visit the chapel definitely, but also the the, the um, towers as well yeah absolutely so it's a private execution within the uh, confines of the tower yeah. um and do we know what elizabeth's reaction was after after well, it was done there's a couple of things there's a story which i tried really really hard to to prove that um the story which is so often repeated i've seen it in um, several history books as fact that elizabeth gave him a ring and said, if you ever need me, um, send this ring to me and I'll know it's you and I'll do, I'll move heaven and earth to do whatever. And the story is that in his last days in the tower, he decided now was the time to use the magic ring and that he, he gave it to his chaplain. And that for one reason or another, either it didn't get to the queen or she got it and decided it was too complicated that she wouldn't actually move heaven and earth after all. But there's you can't find anything to back that up. Whereas I can find lots and lots of transcripts of who he met in the in his last days, what he said, all those things. And something as important as that, I think, would have been documented. Yeah. But 
Elizabeth, there was nothing she could do. If she'd have pardoned him after what people had, had said in Westminster Hall, well, she would have had Robert Cecil to deal with straight away, but she would have had all the others as well. And it could have actually um, endangered her position. It could have, could have weakened her position. She had been seen as a, as a, a weak queen, perhaps, for, for that sort of thing. And um, so she had no choice. What she actually felt about it, we can only imagine. But uh, we know that, you know, um, there's all these things about uh, Robert Dudley's last letter and uh, the fact yeah. that she died just three years later. So it's, it's that bit of the story is very sad, I think, because you could say she did wrong in sending him to Ireland because with his track record, it was going to end in disaster, wasn't it? He was either going to get killed or he was going to do something daft. He wasn't going to um, beat the Irish and and come back victorious, was he? That that was not going to happen. And she she should have known that, I think. Another tragic Tudor story to end with. <laughs> now, <laughs> have to find one with a happy ending. I have actually got some with happy endings, don't they? The the, um, the stories of her ladies in waiting tend to be a lot happier, I think. So I'm looking forward to the next three years doing this. Yes, three. that sounds so good. And now, Tony, before I um before I let you get on with your day, I have a, a, another question for you. And that is obviously you spent a lot of time researching Robert Devereux and immersing yourself in, in his life and his times. And you've painted a you've painted a quite a clear picture of the sort of man that he he was already. But can you just sum him up for us in, in your research? Who's the man that you encountered? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like in all three cases of these Elizabethan favourites, I start off not liking them because Drake was not a particularly likable character. Um, then, you know, Essex was an idiot. And then even Raleigh was liked by nobody apart from himself, really. So I had to find some redeeming features. And I started to think about the, the family background he came from. You know, it was a dysfunctional family. He was damaged as a child by his, his upbringing, by tutors, his mother's absence, his father's absence. And... Um, my first degree is in psychology and the psychology of the relationships is perhaps a thread which runs, I'd like to think, runs through from Owen right through to the death of Elizabeth. Fairly, I mean, fairly recently, it was in the 30s, they first started coming up with the, the idea of um, social intelligence, which is now called emotional intelligence. Yes. And if you look up symptoms of lacking emotional intelligence, it is almost a perfect description of his character in that they act in haste impetuously and think about it afterwards with great regret rather than what most people would do is think hang on a minute if I agree to do that then these might be the consequences he just acts and then afterwards thinks damn that was a bit of a mistake I won't learn from that you know mm -hmm. and um Failure to empathise with other people, that's emotional intelligence. He, he didn't see through Francis Bacon until that moment in Westminster Hall. That's my take on it, because he was absolutely speechless that his, his best friend or one of his best friends would be so, it's like um, a too brute sort of moment. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> but he, he couldn't cope with it. And also... There's a whole wealth of things like um, being tuned in to um, how other people's emotions are, which he, he didn't really ever succeed at. And, you know, that was the downfall of his marriage to, to Francis Walsingham, I think, was that, um, in my view, he consistently underestimated her. And that was a massive, massive mistake. And if he'd have just for a moment sat and listened to her advice, because she had, she had good reason to give him the best advice that she she could, wouldn't didn't she? You know that yeah, of she course. was his wife. And um, you know the story is that he didn't even ask to see her when he was in his last days in the cell. She didn't want to see him. You know what I mean? So it's that's all that's all consistent with um, somebody who's um, got mental health problems, and that that's specifically um, relating to an, an absence of emotional intelligence. I mean. The, the corollary of that is if you've got too much emotional intelligence, then that's just as crippling in a way because you, you're terrified to ever give anybody proper feedback. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yeah. 
hypersensitive then. So there's a happy middle ground, which most of us do without even thinking about it. And um, my view is that things like the, the death of his father, um, he carried those with him all through his life, not as a positive thing, but as a as a kind of benchmark that he had to like at least meet up to or exceed. Which is quite sad, isn't it, really? But I'd like to think that the book that I've I've come up with is not um, too downbeat because it, it it shows his flamboyance and his um, enthusiasm and his bravado. I said he's like a big puppy. I found accounts where he, if asked, he would say that he was a gifted and talented dancer. What he didn't realise was they were all laughing at him, um, not not in the right way. They're laughing behind his back because he was clumsy, stepping on people's feet tripping over, getting the steps wrong. And, and that is, I mention that because I think that's how he lived his life. And you can see it in his letters, you know? His letters are, are full of things that you would think twice before putting in writing, for example. What an intriguing character. I can see why you became, and Jen, why you felt a little bit sorry for him as well. I kind of feel like that in the end as well. So Tony, the very last thing that I ask my guests is for a Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners to perhaps explore after the episode. Do you have a takeaway for us? I've got two or perhaps three. Fantastic. Um, oh, that's, how do I do this? That's, that's um, the plug for the book, by the way. I had, I had that picture commissioned by an artist because I didn't actually want to use the familiar portrait. The other day I bought this book, which you probably, you might even have Amy licenses. Oh, um, Wood Smoke and Sage. Uh, yes, I don't have um, it yet, but it looks fantastic. Right. This is, this is a must buy, not even for Christmas, but you need to get it now. Beforehand, all right. What, a, what an inspired idea that this is a book I cherish, by the way, and it's looking at the Tudors through the five senses and such a clever way of going about it. Because what infuriates me is the two dimensional picture of the Tudors that children are still being taught at school. And then through this, we're thinking about the sights and the sounds and the smells yes. and the textures of their clothing and all those things. And um, I read it. It's quite a, quite a chunky book, but I read it almost in one sitting because it's the kind of book that you just can. You know, you can just, it's, it's structured into the, 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 the five, five senses yeah. and it covers the whole of the Tudor period, right from Bosworth right through the end of Elizabeth. And then the other one, which you've probably got as well, I don't know, do you, are you familiar with this? Oh, it's yes, I'm waiting for mine to arrive, actually, now that you mention it. Oh, this, this is the... Part of a series of books of days. I, I love books of books of hours and yes, things like that. Yes, me too. It's a real. I got a real weakness for them. But the the Tudor Times um, website uh, has got a shop, and they, they've they, they've come up with this, which is what I I'd always thought. There's so many Tudor events on every day, aren't there? It's a job to Absolutely, keep yeah. track of them on. <laughs> and um, this this is a perpetual calendar, really, as a diary where you can note down what happened on a particular day with whatever else. But it's also got little bits in, in it, um, little uh, facts and details and things. But it's just a really nice thing. And kind of, I said I might have three, yes. three um, <laughs> takeaways. This is brand new. It's not even for sale yet, but I sent Ooh. it to review. The Tudor um, Social Light. Yeah. And what what's this? this actually accompanies that really well because I've, ne I've never um, come across Jan Marie Knight before but you, this is one of those books you can open at any page right. and find something you think oh I'll have to look into that a bit more you know I've just opened it at the sweating sickness it makes you realize you know it's particularly with what we're all going through at the moment yes um, I'd like to know more about the sweating sickness I'd like to understand what what the experts say about it now and things like that Right. That's just random page that I've. So is it at. a Tony? Is it a calendar or is it just so explaining? It's, it's, it's actually, it's actually going through. It's called a bite-sized diary chunks of, okay. of information. It goes through each of the. You know, it's got sections on Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth. It goes through each of the, the monarchs really. Right. There's a thing here about um, Hampton Court and all that sort of thing, and uh, Thomas Rothesley 
and this this is a, a one you dip in at any time you don't have to read right it yes you can just open up, up and... you think of it like a, a tudor diary of events which is is quite um esoteric really but for anybody that really is fascinated by the tudors there's a lot of thought-provoking snippets in there oh, does that, does that make... yeah so as a take that's coming out next month i think i'll be reviewing it on my blog it's quite a hard book to review actually because if you don't know anything at all about the tudors then everything in there will be new to you yes <laughs> and if, if you're a tudor nerd then you'll think well like this you know there's a few bits and pieces that I didn't know, whatever. So there's something for everybody, I would say. Fantastic. And for our listeners, um, with the just going back to the, the Book of Days, Tony's one that he was just holding up and showing me was the one on Elizabeth. And I believe there's, some, I know there's a Mary Queen of Scots one. So there's a few for, for right, people to choose from. Them. So if you just if you just type in um, Tudor Times, then then you get you get through to them fairly quickly but i love it i think it's a it's it's a nice thing as well absolutely you know, yeah it looks nice doesn't it it's a beautiful so it's it, a nice gift isn't it it doesn't, it doesn't go in the bookshelf because i refer to it enough that's so right yeah exactly around you know and i think this these are the two books that i've mentioned um wood smoke and sage is not a book that i've read and then put on the shelf and then i find again in two years time which is <laughs> happens to a lot of my books <laughs> Uh, it's been sort of around the house. I'm sure Amy will will love to hear that that feedback that you you've just given. And, well, and done really well. Yeah, absolutely. And as my listeners know, every time someone mentions a book, Tony, you know what happens to me? I go and purchase more books, even though I say that's it. I've done my um, my purchasing for this month. Oh well, doesn't matter. It's all it's all good. You can never have too many books. I say I've and, got a one in one out system at the moment. Oh, okay. But um, that's not going terribly well either. No, I, I like, can't part with any of my Tudor ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. I'm slowly, I'm slowly getting rid of my Wards of the Roses stuff. Now I'm an Elizabethan. That seems quite a long time ago. Yeah, it does. Well, this has been so lovely to chat with you again and have you back on the podcast and hear about your upcoming projects as well. So I, I look forward to hearing more about all of that. And thank you so much for coming back and talking Tudors with us. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It's been great and um, hope to come back again at some point in the future to talk about Sir Walter Raleigh. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Thank you.